when you walk into the control room of a power plant. Um, well, you guys have been to Kennywood in the past couple of years. There's a ride that has an old control room in it, and it's got like dials and gauges, and it looks really archaic and ancient. That's kind of what the control room looks like. So when I moved into, into control systems, um, I was in a very old industry, and a very rigid industry, um, that had been doing automation for years, and a very, a very large group of strong-willed engineers. As, as control systems move from analog to digital, that's when the fun began. So, go back to 2007, I'm at my first engineering conference. There's a group of, of nuclear uh, IT folks, it's a, the NITSO organization, Nuclear Information Strategic Leadership Group. I walk in and there's about 500 people in there. And it was just about the time control systems were digital was starting to become something that we are concerned about on the control room side. And I was sitting in the room and they, they took an attendance and said, how many people are here from IT? And about half the room raised their hand. <laughs> they said, how many people are here from engineering? Half the room raised their hand. And it was wild because they were split right down the middle. And literally, they didn't intermix at all. All the IT guys were on one side of the shop. All the control system guys were on the other side of the shop. And over the years, I learned something interesting. Neither one understands what the other one does. So engineers spend a lot of time focusing on getting things working. Uh, they focus on that particular layer of the OSI model where they're focused on. They forget all about the, the other six. Um, IT folks don't necessarily understand engineering rigor. So engineers design, they build, and they test. When they're done testing, they walk away and they go off and they design something else and they build it and they test it. Most IT folks buy some technology, rip it out of the box, hook it up and start tinkering, <laughs> right? And they get it kind of working and then they tinker some more and they tune it and then they stick it in and say it's implemented and wait for the patch, <laughs> right? And, and um, so a lot of times when we, we start mixing IT in with operational technology, it, uh, it becomes an exciting adventure. So, does anybody in here have any control system experience? Or okay, a couple of folks. Good. It's nice to hear. So, when we were building this presentation, we weren't really sure of the audience, really sure how deep to go. So, this is a little bit of a of a higher level kind of presentation. So, we're going to give a, a bit of an ICS overview because ICS can stem a lot of things, right? It can be something as simple as a PLC. It can be something as complex as a full control system for an automated solution or something as, as highly secure as a nuclear power plant. Right? It can be something that controls a robot. It can be something that controls a television. So it's something that we have to scale based on whether we're talking about the HVAC system in this building that now is Wi-Fi enabled or something that's running an entire power plant. So. The, the presentation is going to kind of go along this way. We're going to talk about different use cases and adversary profile. I'm going to kind of turn it over to Dave for, for some of those deeper dives. Um, we're going to talk about segmentation and isolation and, and grading that based on the, the, the severity of a compromise. We're going to talk about the security challenges that come with, with industrial control systems, and, and they are numerous. Then we'll dig into the stuff that you guys are probably most interested in, some of the in indicators of compromise, and then the approaches that we take to, to secure ICS. That'll kind of turn it over to Dave. So, my name's Dave Spihor. Um, I don't have the experience like Altman does that many years in the field. I've been, I've been in the security field about four and a half years. Um, Westinghouse approaching two and a half years. Um, when I started Westinghouse, I did the our cybersecurity upgrades, our nuclear upgrades. Um, so hands-on engineering, implementing our cybersecurity solutions, architecture review, network design. Um, learned a lot of experience in the time I've been with Westinghouse. So everything I did nuclear, it's been air gapped. Uh, recently moved to corporate, went um, to the cloud. So you know one extreme to the other. So without further ado, move on to the next slide. Um, no ICS. So what's the short definition of this? Um, technical definition, you know, it's a system that encompasses several types of control systems and instrumentations used 
industrial process control. What does that mean? It's not very descriptive, right? So, bunch of actuators, bunch of valves, just something that gives off an electrical signal to a PLC that sends it back to a supervisory control, right? It's all, you know, ICS networks are made up of. So, you know, where, where do we see ICS networks? So, we have power plants, you know, nuclear, gas, coal, solar. Um, nuclear is always air gap, it's the most strict, obviously. Um, manufacturing plants, we have automobile. Um, automobile, be uh, food, beverage, textile. Uh, we have refiners, we have petroleum, coal, chemicals, robotics, we have healthcare, research and development. Skynet's in there somewhere. So I ICS, it's it's everywhere in our life. We we depend on it every day, even though, you know, we don't directly use it. We're not directly involved with it. So, you know, who's going to want to compromise an actual ICS network? You know, it's most likely not going to be an activism group. So, you know, I browse Reddit, and I'm on Facebook, you know, a couple times a month, and everybody gets their information off of memes. They literally base factual news off of this. So, you know, th there's always stuff going around, like, you know, Russia's our friend, blah, 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 this country's our friend. No, they're not. And on an ICS network, you know, that's what we're afraid of. You know, nation states are going to target us, right? So... I'm going to throw off some APTs, just, you know, advanced persistent threats. You know, this is all public knowledge. It's well known, so you, you don't have to deny it if you're one of those people. So, APT 37, North Korea, um, target ICS networks in South Korea and Japan. Um, they're noted for, you know, social engineering attacks, um, using web compromises as their attack vector. Um, 34, Iran, they targeted energy, chemical, government. They focus on cyber espionage in the Middle East. They're noted for MS Office exploitation. APT 33, so I ran again. This group targeted aerospace. They targeted energy. They focused on um, US companies. They use, use HTA extensions and HTML for file exploitation. So we can see a pattern here on how they're trying to get into companies. Um, Vietnam, it's kind of interesting. So this group, uh, 32, they targeted foreign companies investing in Vietnam's manufacturing. Was it they wanted to do it themselves? It's cheaper? It's probably something with money on that one. Um, 30. China. It's a China group. So they targeted members of Southeast Asian, Asian nations. Um, they're noted for long-term command and control dating back to 2005 in these systems. So they're also noted for infecting air gap networks, specialized software and USB pool information they need. Um, their attack vectors, you know, large suite of exploit tools. Um, just, if you think about it, command and control from 2005 from a nation state, good luck getting them out of your system if they're that deep in there. They know it better than you do. Um, 29, Russia, not getting that one. Um, we're, we're guilty of it too, you know, U.S. does it, Stuxnet, that's very popular. That's always the one I think of when I think of ICS. So, you know, that was successful until, you know, basically U.S. won faster results than Israel did. So that's how Stukes technically got out. So when it comes to ICS network and depending on the field you're in, the sector you're in, you're going to have governments wanting to come after you because you're critical infrastructure. <clears throat> so industrial control systems, what, what types are there out there? So a lot of these terms... You know, these might be familiar, they might not be. Um, a lot of these will be thrown around this presentation, so I do want to clarify some things. Um, SCADA and DCS, they're often interchangeable. Um, RTUs, PLCs, they're very similar. Um, Dave was talking about all, uh, PLCs earlier. Um, PLCs are basically a, 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 a device that's connected to a sensor and actuator. Um, they're then connected to a supervisory system, you know. These devices feed the supervisory system um, process variables and set points. Those two terms are going to be important later. So I'm going to dive down just a little bit in the difference between SCADA and DCS. Um, SCADA is a key ability to perform a supervisory control action or operation over a variety of proprietary devices. So, you know, a bunch of actuators, just something that sends a signal to the SCADA device. It's what it's looking for. Um, 
you know, PS, PLCs, they're going to connect back to these devices. They're going to send some sort of process variable. Um, it would be displayed on the HMI, the SCADA GUI, basically. Um, you know, an operator is going to control and respond as needed. So a DCS, this just means distributed control system. They're similar to SCADA in function, but the key difference is, you know, in these systems, there's going to be a larger number of network connections between the PLCs, between the sensors, between the controllers. Um, common attribute with DCS environments, uh, there's going to be more computers on the network. There's going to be more servers and controllers between these proprietary connections with um, the PLCs. Um, DCS networks, they're also known for being more controlling over process and controls with, with less human intervention. Uh, SCADA more or less needs human intervention. DCS, you have software running on an OS basically that can help control. It's less user intensive, I guess you could say. It's just a general, generalized summary, but it's close enough for this presentation. So, next one we're going to talk about PLC controllers that feed these devices. So, PLC it stands for Programmable Logic Controller. They connect directly to timers, sequencers, um, valve relays. They read output data. The most basic function of these is just to connect to an electromechanical relay or just some input-output device. They're generally going to have a smaller amount of devices going to them. Um, how they run, it's going to vary on you know the hardware, what system it's installed in. Um, some PLCs, I often just refer to these as controllers, they're going to have hundreds of devices connecting to them. So these kind of PLCs, or as I'm just going to refer to them as controllers, they're actually going to run an operating system. They're going to run something like VxWorks, something like OS9. So these operating systems, you know, they can have more advanced algorithms. They can run software. They're, there's going to be more use in them sending data back to the supervisory system. So Obviously, with something that runs an operating system, you're going to have similar um, similar vulnerabilities, similar uh, vectors that you're going to see on a regular OS. These things can run on 8-bit, 16-bit, 32, 64-bit. I can run them on my phone if needed. So they're still like an operating system, though. You know, there's going to be separation between user mode, between the kernel level. Um, they're going to have Unix-like processes. They're going to have secure shell, they can send syslog, Bluetooth, USB, you name it. You, you're at full-fledged OS with these things. So on these PLCs, they're going to send process variables and set points back to the SCADA device. Um, process variable, it, it's basically a measured value for something that's being monitored, right? So it, the process value, it, it, uh, process variable, sorry. It can include something like pressure, temperature, level, flow of something. The set point is just the desired value that it's supposed to be at. Um, we might want to hold it at 200 degrees. So in order to calculate and control these, there's something known as a PID controller. Um, it just detects the differences between the set point and the process variable. So it's just the SPPV error. Um, they control it through positive and negative feedback. So to put it in layman's terms, you have one in your vehicle. Um, you know, you have a set point value of 70 miles an hour on your cruise control. The second PV hits 68. The pig controller is going to say, hey, to your engine, to your um, car's computer, go back up to 70. That's just the, the basic um, way to describe these things. So these are relayed back to our supervisory devices, back to, our, uh, back to the SCADA, back to the DCS servers. Um, if you can modify these variables, you can disrupt the system. You can spoof, if you can spoof a process variable like Stuxnet did, you know, you can start causing damage on these. You can start doing whatever you want. Um, modifying these, it's very difficult to do. And it's going to require a lot of knowledge. But if you're going to do this, you're going to have deep pockets and a lot of experience. You're going to be able to pay some. You're going to need groups of people to do this. So... Day take over, but we're. Yeah, so. Sounds like you're starting back up on something. Sorry.
So regardless of the type of ICS network, for the most part, we want to make sure that we isolate it from general purpose networks, especially general purpose networks that have an internet connection. Um, if it's something as simple as your, your building HVAC system, uh, it may be a, a low grade firewall, uh, maybe a next gen firewall, because the consequences of that, that system being compromised are, are significantly lower than maybe the badge system or the security camera system in your building. Most industries use a layer approach. I'm going to jump to that for a minute. This is certainly not proprietary. We pulled this off of Google. Um, we're all familiar with DMZ and network security layers. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the process control industry does not have a very strong uh, or very mature understanding of information security. So they're still very much on the strong shell, gooey middle, approach. That's changing as things go a little bit, uh, as things get more and more integrated and as regulations are starting to come up to speed. But particularly in the energy industry, um, there's there's a, a lower level of maturity when it comes to securing your, your control system. But we want to make sure that operations is DMZ'd off from the corporate networks so that the folks that are actually being able to make changes and get to the human interfaces are going through a DMZ or they're sitting local. Um, further down, your basic control. I don't know why, I guess I should have read this a little more closely before we put it in here. There should be a firewall down in here um, because your engineering workstations are possibly suitable for compromise between engineering workstation and the actual HMI's human machine interface which are the, the folks that are actually sitting doing the control. And the instrumentation and control systems and safety systems uh, are at a much lower uh, type of security level. So the nuclear industry uses a four layer approach. So when we look here, uh, I guess there's maybe five, six layers there. Um, nuclear industry basically has um, level one is the corporate network, level two is the plant network um, level three is, is data acquisition, where things like historians and, and data transfer out can come from. And then layer four encompasses control systems and safety systems. So if you control the reaction in a plant or it's something that needs to be actuated to shut down safely, it has to sit on the inside of a, a deterministic universal or unidirectional gateway. So some people call them data diodes. Al Technology makes a data diode. There's Waterfall. There's a, a few brands out there that do them now. But if, if, if you're in a nuclear power plant, and a lot of this, I think, is more perception risk than it is actual cyber risk. But we can honestly say there is no path in to any control system or safety system in a nuclear power plant from a corporate network or from the Internet. And I, and I think a lot of that was the NRC just wanted to be able to make that statement. But as of 2012, uh, the NRC had, I believe, eight milestones that had to be completed by, by December 31st, 2012. And one of the milestones was to completely air gap every control and safety system in the nuclear power plant. So there's no, there's no network path there. Um, that pushes them back. Yes? So the data diode allows them to communicate out, but not anything to communicate back in? That's correct. So there's literally, there's, they, they cut their receive wires on the, on the connection. And most data diodes are, there's a transmit unit, a receive unit, and a single fiber that goes between them. And, and some of them, depending on the data diode technology that you select, have um, specialized uh, transmit and receive where they remove the auto gain. So you literally, when you buy the device, you have to tell them the distance you're traveling. And they'll they'll set the gain on the transmit and receive. You know when when you when you have a standard you know fiber media converter or fiber channel, even though it's transmit and receive, there's bidirectional communication that goes on to set the auto gain so that the laser doesn't burn off the camera on the other end. Right. So some of the data diodes um, were, were put in place with that functionality disabled. So they'll set the the gain. So you say. You know, we're going to have a 300 meter cable between the, the transmit and receive, and they'll they'll set the gain for that distance. There's some other neat things that we found with data diodes. 
well, I guess not we, but the, the industry found is that they there were some people that were actually figuring out if you could pre-compromise a device on the internal network, um, you could look at power consumption on the data diode and actually get data back into the network and get your data out by, by pulsing the, the signal. You could get data back in seeing the power consumption on the transmit unit. It's been a while since I read that, but it, it was an industry compromise, a data data bypass to do that. So this field's always evolving. So before you start this, yeah. you said the NRC had a milestone to have everything air gap. Mm -hmm. They hit that milestone, and if you know, and if you know also, is the regulator of you guys, right? Is there anybody regulating the regulator, or did they just come up with that on their own? So if, if they didn't hit that milestone, would they have gotten fined? I'm just thinking more of a compliance. So the power plant would have, yes. But what about the NRC? No, the NRC is a, is a regulatory okay. body. They're not going to be fined. Um, so the NRC wrote the rule, right? So the rule is 10 CFR 7354, is, is the cybersecurity law for nuclear power plants. And they put a reg guide together, and then the nuclear energy industry, or institute, also uh, put some guidance together, and most of the power plants follow that. Uh, it was loosely based on, on uh, NIST 882 and 853. And, but they took a series of controls and prescribed them, as opposed to just saying, meet 853. They said, here's a list of controls. You will do all these controls on every device. So if you've done assessments in a nuclear power plant in the early days, um, that was, that was kind of how it was done. Um, that's not helping with instrumentation and control. But yeah. Can, yeah, no, 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 no problem. Uh, you know, I can, I can digress for hours on some of these things. And, uh, but um, so, one of the first things we want to make sure that we're doing, because the traffic is different and, and most industrial control systems are very static in nature, the more you can isolate them, the easier they are to control. And, and we, when we start talking about some of the, the challenges, I'll, I'll be back up for that. Um, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more when we start talking about the weaknesses in, in industrial control systems and, and some approaches to make up for those weaknesses leveraging some of the other pieces in the system. So if you want to jump in. Um, just going to do a couple touch points on challenges of ICS security. So there's very few tools available for monitoring these systems. Um, everything's proprietary. You know, how do you buy something for security if it doesn't know what's monitoring? Um, you know, everything's coded mostly just to get the system functioning. There's nothing more to it. They just want to get it working and don't touch it. Um, you know, SCADA shows the process variables. It shows set points. You know, that's great, but how do I verify that the data is actually concrete? How is it? How do I know it's actually you know right? Um, you know, limited operating systems. It's an issue. VxWorks, OS9, um, other systems. How many people on the ICS network actually know how these things uh, work? Probably none. If you go to the engineering firm that. It, uh, installed the system. They probably don't know either. You know, HMIs, they're scary. Nobody knows how that SCADA device is actually getting its data. You know, is this some magical fairy? Who knows, right? So integrating some sort of monitoring in between these, you're asking for a lot there because nobody understands how the processes work alone. Um, infrastructure learning curve, that's another challenge. A lot of people are brought in with no idea how this equipment works, you know, what it does. They're eventually going to learn the system. They're going to know it more than anybody else in the company. It will be the SMEs on eventually, but, you know, when you ask person A to integrate with person B's network, they're not going to know how to get these devices, you know, working correctly. How do you get them to communicate? There's going to be a barrier there. Um, nine times out of ten, they're probably just going to get communication working and not really worry about security. Um, Integrating new software, new hardware, that's difficult. You know, some systems are fine-tuned. You know, there's challenges in adding any software that might break proprietary software on the system. You might not be able to add monitoring to the network. You might not be able to change a path because it increases latency in the network. You know, adding software, it increases overhead, might increase delay. 
know at this issue with that latency, if uh, process variables and set points rely on something, you change the latency, you're throwing other things out of whack. You're, you start approaching a safety issue at one point. So security or safety, you know, safety always wins. So to go, to go a little bit more on, you know, a few tools available, a few tools available. Um, Non-standard hardware everywhere. You know, nothing in these networks is commercially off the shelf. You can't go to Walmart, Aero CDW is not gonna sell any of this stuff. Proprietary software and protocols, they're almost always used and no one knows anything about them. If you need, if you actually need help on these, you need to go to the developer. The people implementing them, they're gonna have some support, but not as much. Um, the proprietary software is often poorly written. It's created with outdated programming practices. A lot of the stuff you're using is from 1998, 2000, you know. You're using unencrypted communication and secure protocols. Nobody worried about that stuff back then. <clears throat> you know, a lot of places think, you know, proprietary means security because nobody understands it. How am I supposed to, you know, hack your uh, proprietary protocol if, you know, nobody knows how it works? Well, you send base 64 and code it over the system. It's not very secure, right? Outdated software. Um, it's usually intentionally left outside of update programs or upgrade programs. You know, this might be due to budget. Um, patching it might break the system. Um, it's working. Don't touch it. There's a ton of excuses when it comes to trying to update outdated software. So I've, I've heard that problem for a long time, right? The proprietary protocols difficult to understand. I've even talked to some people who try to write network-based protocol parsers for this stuff, and they're like, well, it doesn't even comply with the spec that they wrote for it. The right. documentation doesn't match the implementation. Are there, is there anybody focusing on that problem, almost trying to translate these messy protocols, proprietary protocols, it is something useful. Uh, it is something that could be used by more standard downstream systems. In some cases, yes. So there, there are some standardized industrial protocols like Modbus, Profibus, Fieldbus that um, control system vendors are starting to leverage more of. So it's it's trying to get away from. You know, I, don't, I don't want to name up. I'll pick on Siemens because they've been in the news. Uh, you know, I'm Siemens and I wrote my protocol for my DCS and that's how it's going to communicate. But there are a number of them and they wrote it the way they did for a reason, right? There's a, there's a vendor that, that I've worked with in the past that wrote a deterministic protocol for their DCS. And, and you know, there's two schools of thought. You could serve network bandwidth and only transmit the points that change, right? You know, you only transmit to deltas every second or every tenth of a second, depending on, on how fast it goes. Or do you broadcast every point every second, right? Um, the drawback to, to broadcasting every point every second is um, it's, it's continual network overhead, right? And all that data is out there every second. The advantage of it is if you have a big transient, you don't get a network spike, right? Whereas if you're only broadcasting that point data whenever there's a delta, and you know, in a nuclear power plant, that could be significant, right? If, if you have a loss of coolant event, and all of a sudden pumps are kicking on, the pressurizer pressure is, is you know, increasing heat to make sure that we're making up for the, the lack of pressure due to you know, a giant leak. Um, all of a sudden, all this data is changing. Is the network sized right or currently capable of handling that giant spike? So there, there was a couple of schools of thought there. So there are always going to be proprietary protocols. Yes. Do um, many of your systems use MQTT or some other types of uh, subscriber? No. <laughs> not, not that I've seen. Uh, for the most part, in, in, in a lot of cases, it's layer two multicast, right? Unencrypted layer two multicast. We're not even at the TCP stack. Uh, that's starting to evolve. And some of the vendors are starting to say, you know, now that, now that they can leverage QoS and some other some other features that 
when they were writing some of these things years ago weren't necessarily available during the move from FDDI to Ethernet. Um, we're starting to see more of it, but uh, I haven't seen anybody leveraging any of that yet. Mm -hmm. For vendors with proprietary protocols, do they ever offer any documentation on those protocols? And is it any good? Um, <laughs> if you have Some, the NDA side. Sometimes, if you have the right NDA side, that's correct. Uh, they're, they're very, very protective of their protocols. So, can you buy just a bag of someone's old CDs and manuals? Because that seems to be like the fuel for innovation and stifle the project. So that, that's going to vary vendor to vendor, right? Um, if you think back to how the InfoSec industry was, maybe 10 years ago, um, before information sharing became a, 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 a staple of our industry, uh, where if somebody had something, they kept it, right? <laughs> or we're not gonna release this because it's gonna make me look bad. Microsoft's certainly not gonna publish a vulnerability. We're gonna go hide and fix it. And, and we're still evolving there, but the industrial control system industry, their bread and butter is their protocol. Um, so they're, it's very difficult to get your hands on that old technology. Yeah, highly regional. Yes. Yes. Within, kind of come back to your original thing. So within the OT community in general, the disco network discoveries, like you know, what do you have, is kind of a really important thing. So there's a handful full of vendors that are creating discovery products. Liner. Yeah, there, uh, there's Ver, there's like six. I, mean, I think there's like 40 of them now, but there's only like three of them worth of good salt. But they're using either big data type stuff or that or signature type based things. So. They're, they can't necessarily tell you what's going on in the protocol, but they've figured out enough identifiers to say, you know, it's kind of like a mini end map almost. It's like, hey, we know this might be a something or other. So the desire from the, the control system owners and the OT owners to say, I have 50,000 points. I need something to tell me what's on my network. Uh, that like little micro thing is causing people to solve some of those issues. Yeah, I think I was I was wondering a little bit more like if people are translating these proprietary protocol languages into things that are more generally useful or easier to be interpreted that you could then pipe into your own data analytics stack. Like if we make this stuff actual usable information, derive you know good you know, whatever from it, put it in a tool, and then the class that framework. Has to that, that framework of Metasploit for ICS. Yeah, maybe, maybe not necessarily, but that would be not, not a bad idea. Uh, I was thinking even more just like how do we how do we translate this, translate this into something so you don't have to dissect a proprietary protocol or this one and then it's different from this one and different from this one. How do we kind of unify it in one language to standard? Kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. What can you simulate in the lab for the type of stuff? Is it as, as easy as a VMware player and some machines? <laughs> I wish. Um, so we we spent a lot of time looking at that and for the most part, we end up having to duplicate the ICS. Um, and, and for reasons because it's difficult to simulate how something is going to respond in an adverse condition. I can simulate the, 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 the look and feel of a control system. I can simulate an operating system, but unless I'm running that code, when I break that code, I don't know if the simulation is gonna adequately represent what's gonna happen in the code. So some of the things we developed early on for, for testing um, results of a compromise is, is literally um, simulating Stuxnet, for lack of a better term. So if you think about what Stuxnet did is it sat between, uh, when, you, when you break down a, a controller, there's the actual controller logic and then there's the I.O. Right? So the I.O. Is, is what translates the control logic into a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, whether it's a digital or analog signal that goes out to your pump or it gets data back from your valve uh, or, or, or meter, right, that says, you know, move this thing 20 degrees. And, and it literally, they wrote a hardware abstraction layer between the I.O. and the control. And so it was, it was feeding the control everything's fine and telling the I.O. to do something different. So we kind of built two, a simulator with two data sets. The data set was what's presented to the plant simulator and another data set was what's presented to the plant simulator. One was to go back to the user and one was to go out to the control. And, and that way we could say, okay, if you have a situation where your control system has been compromised and the data that's coming back to you is different than what's actually happening in the plant, 
how do we identify it? Can we identify it with the tools that we have? And that's jumping ahead a little bit into what I'm, some of the things that, that I use when I, when I design a, a security system with the limited tools that I have. Right now, we're, 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 we're kind of talking about vulnerabilities. And a lot of times, the vendors, at least historically, didn't have vulnerability information. So when I'm buying a PLC from nuclear instrumentation, right, from nuclear instruments, I'm getting a little box, right, and it's running an embedded operating system that may be proprietary or it may be a scaled down version of a VxWorks or a QNX or sometimes even a Windows embedded. But they didn't bother to, to enumerate the vulnerabilities, right? They're getting better. So the NRC requires all the power plants to have their current, current vulnerability lists. Hey, Dave. Um, and I, yeah. I'm sorry, I feel like my questions go off of the point of the meeting, but to go back to what you were saying and simulating that ICS, uh, do you happen to know some kind of, or even close to a dollar amount of what that would be for you all to try to do to get that information? Yeah. Because, <laughs> so, so adding that up could be expensive over time, right? Yes. Yes, it is. So to, to, to build a representative sample of the control system is somewhere around 60 grand. And that's just that's just the hardware. That's not manpower to set it up. It's just the purchase. Are there any good companies that have the database? I, I know one automation federation, like the Qualys of ICS, just some kind of global clearinghouse, it's not vendor specific. I guess it doesn't exist. It's just a bunch of mailing lists. And there, no yeah, for the most part, they're starting. That's starting to happen. Epri is is. And again, this is if I'm sticking right where my base of knowledge is in the power industry. Epri starting to put some things together, and they're they're starting to look at um, building vendor sheets that have their their common vulnerability and security database. So um, they're they're building a, a new assessment model from the ground up. I don't know if it's going to take off or not, but you you um, they're looking at if you think if you think in engineering terms of material material data sheet, right? If you're going to build a device, so they're looking at I forget what they're calling it now. I haven't been doing this for almost a year, but um, they're building literally a component data sheet, for lack of a better term, and then you can stack those component data sheets into a system and layer the, the defensive architecture from the ground up. We have some kidding architecture uh, from Wesco, my, my company. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, where you want to, we're just doing it for efficiency, but being able to layer in like you know security vulnerability information for programs that, that you're developing. Is an interesting feature just to develop to sell the stuff as quick as possible, but it's an opportunity to insert that latest bulletin information. So it's also a pretty good data. Yeah, sure. I see it sounds pretty good. Yeah. They're being absorbed by US service, become a big thing. That's a good one. Yeah. Based off of like, the vulnerability information you described, you, know, you buy the black box. Um, is a lot of the code developed in, by development and engineering in-house, or is that the contracting, or is that the vendor that you're purchasing the object from? Or, uh, it, because like something like Stuxnet, like you mentioned, that was really, it, it sounded, from my understanding, which I could be wrong, it sounded like the majority of that was based off of vulnerabilities in like Step 7 and the IDE for Step 7 to inject that code, and the developer never saw it, right? That wasn't so much in any of the devices as much as they just did what they were told to do. Right, right. So, so you know, Stuxnet maybe is a bad example because we all know that was an inside job, right? <laughs> I mean, but the way it worked is a good reference to understand what you know what's happening. But it's almost all um, code developed by the by the vendor that we're purchasing things from. At least at Westinghouse, we don't really. We don't build boards anymore. So, so one of the things that that we have to be careful of, if you're going to have an engagement in an industrial control system network and you're going to do a security audit, be careful scanning it. Um, what you'll find is a lot of the network stacks are maybe incomplete or developed to the bare minimum of the, of the standard, uh, and, and they may not respond appropriately to an unthrottled scan. Um, 
we, I've, I've bricked a couple of devices. I've seen some of my customers come in and want to run a you know, full-blown Nessus scan on throttle, and they've, they've bricked them. We had a couple that were unrecoverable. You would think you could power it off and bring it back, but for some reason it, it, it was unrecoverable. We had to replace the units. Um, you all also find out that some of the operating systems have not evolved. And, or in some cases, they're using an old operating system because that's what works and that's what always worked. And they don't necessarily prioritize processes appropriately. So if the network stack gets a higher priority than the operating system, it'll freeze. And, you know, we're not going to see that in, in Linux or Windows, but in some of these older operating systems, you'll see that. Um, and in other cases, you know, when you have a deterministic network and you overload the network, it's very susceptible to DOS. I don't even mean DDoS. It's susceptible to DOS because the, the the network bandwidth is very tightly calculated to make sure that we're getting that deterministic data when we need it. And it, 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 it um, is that bandwidth um, regulated by the operating system? Like, you know, is it regulated on levels? I'm not sure what you mean. So you said yeah, earlier that everything's separated by four levels, right? Right. So. Does each level have its own or? Well, each level is going to be going to be isolated at layer two, right? You're not going to see uh, communication going between those those levels. Security layer, or OSI layer two, not security. Sure. Next, I guess this is. Let me see. About, so, while we're while we're still on a topic, so again, a lot of the a lot of the tools that we have are very good at looking at things that we know about, right? We, we, can, we can look at TCP IP, we can break it down 10 ways from Tuesday. Um, we can look at um, what's happening at, at Ethernet layer, we can look at application layer, we have next gen firewalls. Um, all of those things take time. And when we're looking at even voice traffic, right, the, the latency that we can accept in voice is something that we maybe not be able to tolerate in um, in industrial control. So I was working on a particular power plant, and um, they had a data link that was coming in from the other side of the plant, and they wanted to secure this data link. And I'm like, that's fine. We'll stick an industrial firewall in between the link. And they said, well, we're kind of at the limit of our latency. I'm like, what's your latency? And they're like, 600 nanoseconds. And I'm like. Ah, uh, <laughs> so I, you know, I pull up the specs and it's two milliseconds on the, you know, to get through that firewall. And, and you know, I had 600 nanoseconds to work with. So, so what do we do? Well, we don't put the firewall in there, right? Um, I, uh, the best you can do is, is, is put a passive tap in and, and steal a little bit of light <laughs> and, uh, and, and look at it in parallel. So there are, there are certain things that, that we're up against when we're dealing with control system because that data has to get there when it has to get there. Um, a nuclear reaction is maybe a little more difficult to control than some of the other things that we're dealing with. But you know, if you've, if you've got robotics that have to put a screw down at a certain time in a process, and, and you know, if, you're, if your tolerances are, are very tight, and, and you know, that, that piece of material is going through and it's got to hit when it's got to hit, and you're off, I don't know, 100, hundredth of a millimeter maybe, I don't know, 10 thousandth of an inch, you may, you may blow up the whole process and how much does that cost? So those are, those are things that, you know, a lot of times when we're, when we're putting our IT hats, we don't get the engineering side of it. It's just like, well, just, just stick that firewall in there. Or, you know, I need to inspect every one of those packets as it goes through and yeah, well, you just broke it, <laughs> right? So. We'll, we'll address a little bit of, of the approaches that I, I've used in the past to, to deal with that. Okay. Right. So, a lot of issues with ICS networks, it's, you know, there's almost a fear with them if you don't understand them. So not completely understanding HMI supporting infrastructure. It's going to be a challenge for keeping these networks secure. Um, there's limited understanding between, you know, an HMI and a user. They're not going to know what's going on. They're going to be trained to look at the information on the screen. They're going to know what the values are supposed to be. Um, 
They're going to know how to do their job. They're going to be great at it, right? But are they going to understand something on the ordinary occurs? So trying to get more towards IOCs than previous vulnerabilities that we we're discussing. Um, to expand on this a little bit, um, you know, PLC, it might send an alarm. It's bad, right? It might send some sort of debug, some sort of, you know, the variables going the wrong way. You know, somebody might ignore this alarm. Somebody might just say, you know what, we're going to look at this in the future. Like, we don't have downtime. We don't have an outage. We're in production. We can't test anything, right? So they're just going to, they're going to be at the HMI. They're just going to reset the value where they need it. Um, at some point, you know, it's just going to keep getting reset and reset and everybody's going to ignore it. Nobody's ever found an issue. Nobody can figure it out and nobody, no, nobody has time to look at it. So at this point, it's training a user to expect it's normal on the network. You know, this is out of the ordinary. Is it malicious? It might not be. You know, is it bad solder? It's possible, but we need to get this investigated. And moving into indicators of compromise, you know, a lot of people and things like this come up, they're not going to investigate. So we, we have to train users to start looking for these indicators of compromise. And, you know, this stems from vulnerabilities that might be on the system. So when you go investigate something, nobody understands it. You, you're going to get a lot of pushback, you know. It's not broken. Don't fix it. No one understands if it breaks. We're not going to get it running again. You know, we can't afford downtime. We can't afford budget. All of these things... They can be indicators of compromise. There's tons of things on ICS network, and if you don't understand it, you, you're not going to know what to look for for in the, uh, IOCs. So, things we look for for indicators of compromise. Um, it's not a lot. It's not a whole lot different between a regular network. You know, we're going to be looking for deviations in network traffic. Um, DCS systems. There's a lot of computers, firewalls. Don't you know? You have domains on. Normal, normal practices apply to this. Um, you know, it's possible to monitor traffic to these PLCs and what's going on. We can do that. Whether or not you're going to implement it, it, that depends on what sector you're in. So, you know, changes in set point or process value data. It's another very important IOC. It's probably one of the most difficult things to detect on a network, as we were discussing before. Um, and there's not a whole lot to do to, you know, check for changes in this and how to actually figure out something's malicious. Data historians, process historians, they come into use and oftentimes you're in your custom software to create these things. Um, changes in user behavior, you know, that's an obvious one, but on ICS network, everything's predictable. You know, I should be able to know what's going to go on in the future. Nothing changes. These networks are very static. Um, Anomalous workstation activity, that's an obvious one. Um, you know, changes in DCS servers. The, these run standard operating systems sometimes. They run Windows, they run Linux. You can look at, you know, regular indicators compromise you do on your home workstation. Another great thing for finding IOCs is using threat intelligence. So, CERT, FBI, DHS, they all perform investigations. You guys know this. And you know, they release the rules and techniques that are currently going on in the wild. It's a very, very valuable resource. So, moving forward, we're, I'm going to just go into a little high-level overview of what we actually look for for an IOC. Um, you know, deviation in the network, very static, predictable. So, you know, we're looking for IP address, new IP addresses, new host names, new ARP entries, changes in ARP entries, CAM flows. Those, that's easily detectable. Um, you know, random port connections, we all know that. Um, oddball connections. So, scan, scan like activity. There should never be a vulnerability scanner on the network. There is, you know, it's going to be documented, you're going to be in downtime, it's going to be from a well known IP. We should be able to notice this really quick. So, how do we actually detect this stuff? How do we control it? So, again, standard cybersecurity techniques. Um, IP addresses, host names, ARP, ARP entries. We're going to use some sort of integrity monitoring. We're going to use rogue system detection. <clears throat> um, camp flooding, random port connections, scans, anything. We're going to use a SIM and NID. Same thing we use on a regular corporate network. Um, NIDs on, for us, for nuclear, it's always a NIDs. It's not a NIPS. We want everything to pass by 
react to it later because we don't want false positive breaking something. <clears throat> yeah, that'll vary on the field, but so you know, send span data to your net, send syslog to your sim, grab whatever logs you can. You know, all this it's well documented. You should be able to create a list of IP addresses and pipe it into your sim. You should be able to write roles around everything. You just have to be proactive when it comes to an ICS network. So the next thing to discuss is changes in set point data. Um, this is incredibly difficult to do. It's going to require a lot of knowledge of the system. This is a point where Dave was talking about where, you know, IT was on one side, engineering was on the other side. When it comes to monitoring, you know, set point data and looking for vulnerabilities, we need to work with the INC engineers, all their techs. They know what's going on. We don't. We, we don't have the skill set to actually understand the software. So we have to work with the people that understand it. So, you know, set point data, it's predictable. It should follow a pattern. By pattern, it's like, you know, summer versus winter on certain temperatures of, uh, you know, coolant, for example. Um, you know, product output, changes in functionality with peak times and down times. So, Another indicator of compromise to look for is, you know, you're going to take your set point data, you have your data historians, you're going to want to compare the present, compare it to the past. Are these value, values similar to last year and, you know, what they are now? Is there a pattern moving in the direction? If I take all my data and put it in a spreadsheet, you know, is my heat index going straight up? You know, am I going to start blowing something up? What's going on? You have to just compare it on a historical level. Um, we're going to want to My, for us, we're trying to get there, but right now it, a lot of it's going to be more manual. So, you know, our historians, you know, they can look at that, but to the level of, you know, basically, I guess, thread hunting for this stuff, not not a lot of places are there. When you set the uh, set points from PLC, um, what then verifies that the set point has arrived at its set point? Is it the same PLC or is it a secondary system that then retrieves uh, the set point arrival data and um, sends it back for comparison with what the set point was set to? It's going to be so, the same system. So it's going to vary whether you're talking about a SCADA system or a distributed control system. Um, that's typically done in the controller. Right? So we have the I.O., we have the controller. Um, the control logic in most cases runs in the all that set point data is set in variables in the controller. The control logic is doing the comparison, so it's getting the data back from the I.O., running through its logic, and then making its adjustments based on that. And then in most cases, if it's a distributed control system, it's going to distribute the, the status of every one of those set points to the rest of the network. So you know, typically, you'll have a series of controllers, you'll have a series of workstations, and they're all in the network, and they're all broadcasting whatever it is they need. So if you're if you're an operator and you want to make a change, you're literally changing a set point value. The next time that gets broadcast, the controller that needs to fix it up says that's my value. My my current value is four. It needs to be seven. It makes the, the appropriate change in the control logic to affect the, the control change until that set point value comes back at seven, and then they did broadcast those changes. Some of that, you know, the control logic will have ramps in it or instant change or it'll be a change or you know it needs to be seven in seven minutes or it needs to be seven in ten seconds. In my experience I found too is uh, it's the even though it wasn't necessarily built in for a cyber type risk, a lot of the engineering and control systems will happen where it's like something if this PLC breaks uh, and I'm worried about that happening, something really bad is gonna happen, they'll start putting in redundancy in it. Now unfortunately that redundancy is usually just I have two of the same PLCs or uh, Cyber uh, security standpoint, if you compromise one, you compromise the other in the same factor typically. But it's so I, I guess I'm saying it's, it's inherent to the engineer's design, it's really critical. You might see them say, I don't trust just one PLC, I want to have two verifying this. Very rarely, though, for security purposes, usually for operational resiliency. So, something that I didn't see on the deviation slide before this was. Um, any thoughts for canaries? Do you 
you guys use those in your systems? Not in the control system. No? I think it'd just be interesting to have, if they are targeted, to just have them sitting on the networks that you're listening to, and they're just sucking in data. Um, because people, like, if there's somebody in your network, they all have those things you're saying. Yes. The dog part is you don't want them broadcasting on that network, right? right? So to look like a true honeypot, they've got to be broadcasting that data too, right? If somebody's going like, why is that guy quiet? <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Did you remember the 8-bit Atari game, sorry, the uh, Scram? It was a cartridge game, and it was a simulated nuclear power plant. I mean, more fun toys. Play with the DMs. It could simulate noisy factory, damn vulnerable web app, damn vulnerable um, <coughs> chicken in a biscuit machine. Whatever you guys <laughs> Whatever you make fun. No. Yeah, yeah. So, so can we talk about maybe down the road doing some, some hands on stuff and trying to figure out how to make that work? I had an engineer that worked for me for a while that um, I got him a, a control system to play with and he was down, he had the box ripped off and he was he was soldering leads onto the, the uh, maintenance chip, maintenance ports inside the controller to start seeing what he could fire at it. Powerful sales tool, and they're selling them to show them when they really want to play. They, it's just money in the bank in terms of it, just shows them. And there's special products like a Tossie Box, is one from Finland, it's supposed to bridge IT and OT networks. This sounds a terrible idea. But if there's the demos, we'll make it more fun out of them. It sells this thing. Yeah. Okay, so how do we detect and control IOCs and set like data? Um, you know, there's there's multiple ways. Um, generally, the first thing is use a process historian. So, this monitors all the data. This receives all the data. Yeah, let me jump in on that for just a second. Particularly in nuclear power plants, after Three Mile Island, there has to be a data historian. Think of a data historian as a sim for process data. So, it literally records every single set point on the network in real time, right? And, and I, I think it's one second inference. So we have that amazing tool available to us. Right? That's that's one of the things that I leverage the most when I'm looking for indicators of compromise. Because I'm jumping too far ahead, but we've got a bunch of operational technology that leverages standard information technology. So it's all Cisco switches. Right, the, all the security is performed by domain controllers, right? So an active directory is running out there. You've got Windows workstations, you've got Windows servers, or in some cases, Linux, right? Maybe some old ones you're actually still running Solaris. <clears throat> but you've got so you've got visibility into parts of it, right? And then you've got some dark spots, but you've got a whole different kind of visibility when you can look at, wow, I can look at the actual data that's running the plan. I can start comparing that to normal, right? And so the historian and the control system are very good at looking at the data, but they're very weak at looking at security controls, network controls. You know, the, the, the plant operator or the, the system operator doesn't really care what the network's doing. They just want to know that their their operation is working basically. So your data historian, I mean, do you silo that off to the, to the degree that you would ever get most of your other control network stuff? Um, like, I, I came from a company that used their data historian a lot to help predict, like, when they might need further supply of, you know, something that went into this process. And so a lot of business systems would need old folks in the firewall or DMZ to get to that data historian, which is terrifying, right. but... Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so yeah, yeah. send it out over OSI five out the yeah. DMI owner across the firewall. Send it out yeah. and let the business yeah. system yeah. That's 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 that. Yeah, out, out. Yeah. yeah. So being predictive and thinking back on that, right? Uh, I think a couple slides ago you had uh, user behavior. Is there is there a tool or something you guys are using or looking at to use in the future to prevent? Issues when users aren't behaving as analytical. So when looking at like like you saw Dave was put up there a little bit, set point changes per hour. So in a nuclear power plant, when you when you look at the historical data, you look at the trend data, trend data. When the plant goes from offline to 
critical, right? So you go on super critical until you get critical. You want to see a nice solid ramp from zero to 100 percent power. For 18 months, you want a straight across line, right? It's running at 100 percent power for 18 months, and then when you take down gravity, you want a nice ramp down, and it's good to go, right? So, so think, the, think about like, user behavior, though, right? And being more preventive. So if someone's doing something, you shouldn't you get alert that we maybe pops up and says, oh shit, stop them, right? Instead of looking at what's happening and maybe it's too late because somebody already did something they shouldn't have done. It'll be a detection alert for the most part, depending on what it is. Yeah, the tool that you guys look at uh, that uses, or are you, that you guys use that will say analytics for that kind of stuff, or? Not user analytics, not history, and not, you know, smart algorithms to piece this together. Um, you know, Sims can do that these days, nothing, you know, we're technically using is going to do it. Um, you know, there's going to be stuff in the works, but from what I've seen, I've been on, you know, I've been technically out of ICS for a few months now, so we could, we might be using the tool. But for me, we haven't done anything that specific for saying, hey, user A and B always comes on at this time. Why are they on at this time now? It's just we're going to have sim rules. We're going to have some sort of rule written around that. You know, these are the windows they shouldn't be on. Well, in, in, in most. Our specific environment, and most of the large-scale process control environments, these systems don't really have a lot of options for users. So if you're an operator in Python, and when you log into your workstation, you only can, you know, you're, you're locked down with certain policy limits and certain functions. And if you're doing that, you're doing that in a, um, in a very controlled manner. And then if you're making changes on the network, got a senior reactor operator sitting behind you. Um, you're in a control room that you didn't get into, you know, without going through a radiation scanner, metal detector, x-ray, right, past a whole bunch of armed guards. You're sitting in a control room with, with three people that you're with every day. You're in behavioral observation. Um, so we're looking for not necessarily an insider threat. We're looking for an external so we're looking for, you know, we typically see five set point changes a day in a nuclear control system. We just saw 100 set point changes in the last hour. What's going on? Instead of insider threat, what about accident threat? Where someone does something that they might not be aware they're doing and other people aren't paying attention. In a nuclear power plant, that's not going to happen. Now, now, in other control systems, that could very well happen. I mean, I, I was walking through. Early on, I was, I was working pretty heavily with the simulator for our plant. And they were doing a lot of operator training. And um, literally, the way it works <laughs> in a nuclear power is you've got a procedure that you follow. And you read the, read the step. The operator interprets the step. He reads it out loud. He says, I, I am going to move the mouse over top of this button. Well, the senior actuator operator says, I confirm you've moved the mouse over top of that button. Next step. I'm going to left click the mouse on this button. The senior actuator says, I confirm. Right, I've clicked the left button. I'm not going to work on my stand. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But, but literally, you know, in, in that type of environment, um, the, the, the risk of insider threat is pretty low to the point where the NRC told us to not consider insider threat. Now, you know, I was I was listening to a presentation by the chief nuclear officer of Waterford Nuclear Power Plant um, right after Hurricane Katrina. And he was talking about what it was like to weather a hurricane in a nuclear power plant. And at about day three, um, the National Guard came to them and said, "There's a chemical plant, a chlorine manufacturer plant, just up the coast." When the hurricane came, they just shut the lights off and left. They didn't shut anything down, and they didn't know what the status of this plant was going to be. Um, had this thing gone up, they were they were having discussions as to you know, the nuclear power plant, the control rooms were medically sealed and was pressurized, right? So they were determining would they bring everybody from the plant into the control room and they had eight hours of, of survivable time. Or did they keep the operators in there to keep the plant stable for the 24 hours that they had and let everybody else die? Um, 
It was a very, very interesting scenario. But to keep in mind that there are process controls that don't have the same level of rigor that goes into the program. There's lots of them out there. Some of them, um, you know, the power plant has a safety system. It'll shut down. It'll run. To, it'll, it'll be just fine if everybody walks away. It'll shut down. You can walk away. The, the, the safety systems, as long as they have electricity, keep the pumps going. They'll be fine. And there's on-site generators for that. The chemical plant could be spewing chlorine gas. If it catches fire, it becomes phosgene. Talk about mass destruction, much more dangerous, but less regulated. So, yeah, with the, like I said, when we start talking about industrial control systems, like I said, you go anywhere from the HVAC system in this building all the way up to, you know, a missile defense system that you push a button and doors open and a rocket goes off. Gonna sleep all time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think he covered data historians pretty well. Huh? Um, to answer your question, we're going to have a replicated historian on the outside network. So for us, we're typically going to have a data dive, some sort of waterfall right here. The data historian will just send, you know, one-way traffic on it. It's the replicated. And we'll have another firewall going out to for it. And, you know, you can either have a rule in there, get in the replicated historian, or you can have another thing off the network to view it. But we do keep those pretty secure. <clears throat> So, got just uh, the data historian, um, the set point data. We can actually create sim rolls around these. So, there is talk about, you know, how much are we de actually decoding these proprietary protocols. So, a lot of times, we also rely on the software to generate its own logs. So, you know, some of this software, it can generate Windows logs, it can generate syslog. So, we can also pipe that into the sim, parse it as needed, and create alarms around those. Um, you know, some some uh, proprietary software, it'll actually write all of its set points, all of its uh, process variables to a WordPad file. We can parse that. We can actually make sim rules around that. So we can take modern security software and integrate it with this. Um, another interesting one, um, they have PLC firewalls. So these de devices, you know, there's a lot of NDAs around them. So can't really go into much detail, but you know, I can put a PLC firewall between the actual PLC and sensor, between the PLC and the SCADA device. Um, you no, know, I can allow, I can set these firewalls to only allow certain conditions. So, you know, I can only allow one way communication to a Modbus device, for example. So, if I just want, you know, communication going out of the Modbus device back to the SCADA device. I can tell this PLC firewall, you know, what registers it's allowed to send, what range, you know, 800 to 1200, one way only, anything out of that, I don't care about. It's not going to be two way, it's not going to damage anything. So these are very great at keeping integrity. You know, it stops an actor from modifying these. Um, IOC change in behavior and all this workstation activity, you know, this this is straightforward for us. So, you know, everything comes down to shift work, admins working OT. You know, we shouldn't be seeing any weird codes on the system. There shouldn't be Windows log on code 10 RDP from a random server, you know, code 4 for a scheduled task for a regular user kind. We shouldn't be seeing that stuff. This, you know, SIM should be able to detect this pretty easy. Um, Odd file names. This can be difficult to detect, but you know, using threat intelligence, you can also find them. Um, some some files on the server it's used by a process should be read only. You know, you should monitor these files closely for changes. Um, new software on a system. You know, you open the door for ransomware. So, this section, you know, it's straightforward. But I also see it talked about more in theory than actually being implemented. Um, a lot of places I've worked at, you know, it's just on IC, it's other corporations. Like, a lot of people don't whitelist their applications. They don't whitelist their software. They don't use application control. So, you know, a sim's going to alert on logon events. You know, it's going to alert on evil activity. But 
Milagosa or Threat Intelligence helps. File integrity monitoring, you know, might be able to lock a couple files down, but you know, you actually need application control. You need whitelisting of some sort. You put ransomware on an old DCS system, just kiss goodbye. Um, you know, when using application control on these systems, you need to lock things down to file level, not directory level, because you know you can hide stuff anywhere. It should be pretty easy if you guess, you know, where I can store files if you just whitelist based on directory. A lot of things proprietary sticks out like a sore thumb. A lot of times you're gonna have to work with the vendor for application control in an ICS network. Um, when I've worked with whitelisting and application control, I've bricked the system multiple times. I've bricked multiple systems in one sitting before. No, it happens. So, threat intelligence. I kind of want to. Th this is actually probably one of the more important slides I have. You know, it doesn't actually list a single indicator of compromise. You know, threat intel. It just describes what's going on in the wild. So, you no know, wonderful thing. Wonderful resource. You know. The FBI, DHS, CERT, you know, other three-letter organizations, they perform in, uh, investigations based on, you know, intel they receive, something following a compromise. Then they release this information to us. So for an ICS network, you know, we need to know this information. It gives us the campaigns going on, you know, what nation states are actually occurring, right? So what's going on in the wild? Like, you know, in ICS, we're kind of in our own bubble. We don't know what's going on. Using threat intelligence, it's a great resource for us. Um, these articles, they're incredibly detailed. They go point A, you know, A to Z, everything. They cover everything, like how the actors started, how they got in, where they got in, what data they got out. They just, everything they can find, they list in these articles. And if you actually follow it, you know, the techniques that, you know, these bad actors use, they're very clever, they're very witty. It, when I read them, they personally, they just blow my mind. So, you know, control, all this text right here, is from a single threat intelligence article. Um, top 10 lines, you know, it's just snort rolls. Bottom stuff is your best practices. Um, this is actually pulled from a threat intelligence article of a campaign with Russia. This campaign specifically targeted one of the nuclear power plants I was working at. Um, I was actually on site when they tried. So there's a lot of information here. I actually cut out half of this. And there is, this isn't just, you know, do, do something simple. This is actually detailed relating to the campaign. So the best thing I can recommend is look at these articles, be proactive, put them into your program. I think we've talked about a lot of this. So let me, let me maybe rewind a little bit. We all know the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. In most control systems, the number one piece is integrity. And when I first say that, everyone pushes back and says, what about availability? Well, as you heard this gentleman say earlier, a lot of times that, that availability piece is already built into the system. Every one of our systems in a power plant are either dual or quad redundant with, with voting. Right? So if the system drops, they'll fail in a safe state and they'll fail in a known state. Almost all control systems will do that. So that pushes availability down. Integrity is, is way more important um, from a security standpoint because if the data is wrong, bad things can happen. Right. If that robot arm swings an extra six inches, bad things can happen. If the temperature goes up in a, in a, in a critical in a critical combustion or a chemical reaction, bad things can happen if it's off just a few degrees or the mixture of something is off just a little bit. And it might just be enough that, that you don't notice it. Which is why, you know, being able to, to know good helps you find bad in a industrial control system is so important. It's taking the time to analyze every little piece of doing the due care of looking at all of the processes, all of the protocols, the communication, and what's normal, what talks to what every day. So if something is out of normal, it's easily identifiable. 
and that just takes time. Um, the other piece is most companies don't want to spend anything on securing their digital control system because right? they don't see it as dollars. It's, it's easy to it's easy to talk to a business owner about protecting their money. It's harder to, for them sometimes to be able to translate that process that makes them their money into their money. And control systems are not cheap. You know, compared to a standard IT system, they're, they're a factor more expensive. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I can't really get into commercial details, but they're considerably more expensive to put in a, a, a digital instrumentation and control system than it is to, to throw a simple network together. So they've already spent a ton of money on this thing to get it working, and, and they don't want to spend another dollar. I was talking with a with a company at one of the one of those Mitchell conferences that I mentioned earlier, and they had some groundbreaking technology. Right? It was fantastic. They did exactly what we're talking about here. They took all of the process control data, and all of the network data, and integrated it and fed it back to the SIM. So they, they took it and correlated it, and they allowed you to make rules around you know, set point changes per second. Compare that to the batch data literally pull all that out, integrate it, and feed it into the SIM to do additional parsing and be able to, to process the alerts. And um, that's why they are 20 years ahead of their time because nobody would buy it. And, and that's where the industry is right now in industrial control because, you know, I already put in this $5 million control system and now you're telling me I need to spend another 800000 or another million dollars to make sure that it's secure. Can't I just lock it? Right. It's a, you know, for us, it's in a nuclear power plant. Like by the time you've gotten in there, you know, if you pull a screwdriver out and it's not on the procedure, there's a guy with a, with a weapon showing up to talk to you. My wife works in nuclear. She was she was going into uh, you know, the dock now. What's what's what I heard? No, no, no not that. Uh, Braidwood. No. I'm drawing a blank. She, she was on site, and she was putting, a, actually doing a SIM upgrade on one of the control systems. And she had gone through all her site clearance, but the, the security guard in the, in the clearance office hadn't updated the, the database system. She was going to walk in, and they were just badging into a, a, a controlled access area. And, um, she put her badge in, and it didn't work. The, the guy that was with her put his badge in, and it didn't work. And then the, the um, the escort that was with them badged and opened the door. And it was less than 30 seconds from the time they got in and the door closed. They were met by two very nice young gentlemen with M16s wanting to know, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? Please come in and sit in this room while we work this out. So, you know, in many cases, they don't want to hear another million dollars to, to secure something when they've already taken a lot of those. So you, you, you'll encounter that too. There are, there are technologies, there are companies that are doing some of these things, but in many cases, it's budget that just isn't allocated. So, again, kind of off topic, but for a power plant, do you know how it takes them to see our life? They don't get any power. So all the money they spend trying to get money back, or? Uh, they, they, yeah, for, for, for them at this point, securing their plan, outside of being regulatory compliant is, is dollars spent. They don't see it as, you know, they're not, they're not making an extra dollar, right? They're so not, overall, from the power plant though, and selling power and all that, mm -hmm. uh, we're drawing this, right? To go digital control? Or not, not even controls, just in, in general, right? How long does it take them to make their money back based on how expensive it is to put together a building? <laughs> depends on the plant, right? It depends on a lot of things. It, it depends on the, the you know, how power is sold. Is it regulated or non, non regulated market? Just I think it's um, yeah, the average. I think the average calculation that we use when, when a plant goes down is about two hundred thousand dollars an hour. That's what they that's what they lose. They're not producing power. So figure two hundred grand an hour. Four point eight million a day. Data? Is that um, is that like a standard kind of format for all the power plants since it was like required that all the power plants 
No, there's, there's, there's only a few though. OSI buys a big one and they're pretty open, right? Because they're not just as big as our plant. So um, each vendor has their own. Like, I've worked mostly with OSI Pi. There, there are, I think there are three of, of the major ones, but OSI Pi is just about everywhere. And I, I think you can get trial licenses. Well, it's funny that you say that. I'm like, there, there, there's other vendors other than OSI Pi. I mean, it's like, I mean, that's kind of a semi serious question, but I think they will like. So, in my experience around it, you have the standardization because, like, literally, I, I'm making that number up, obviously, but it's like 95% of market share it has to be that much. I really have never come across a little bit. Yeah, unless they're using a proprietary vendor. Yeah. Well, even then, they still want it integrated in. They still want OSI Pi. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, all the devices. In power plants, that's true. But if you get into some of the manufacturing, the less regulated type things, then you won't see that. Uh, you know, it comes down to the dollars. Like, and there, he's regulated because he has to do everything. Oh, yeah. Um, but if you go to like that chlorine plant, you're saying, I guarantee you they're not either sampling this quickly or this area itself. There's a business decision behind it. And, you know, the C suite understands. They're like, oh, I need that information you mentioned uh, for reordering of materials. You know, that's a, there's an ROI associated with that. So from a business drive, then you'll get that instrument. But if it's like, oh, I just need to know this random, the temperature in this room, there's no business. I mean, I guess the hotel might want to know that, but it's probably not safe. Yeah. The nuclear is the only one that's regulated to have that story. Yeah. No, all of, all of energy is. Um, uh, uh, oil and gas is as well, but it's the level of uh, instrumentation. 